Hello, I'm Glenn McGinnis, and welcome to Outburst. This week, celebrating National Indigenous Peoples Day and asking what it means to be Indigenous in Canada. It's a time of movement and we have, with reconciliation and everything happening, it's something to be proud of. Why not provide a national holiday that everyone can have an opportunity to have some time to spend with their families and learn a little bit more about Indigenous culture, right? As to who we are and how things should be in this country with, in regards to Indigenous issues. We need funding now to help enhance the language across Canada. That's for First Nations, that's for Inuit, that's for Métis. We have to get this done. From coast to coast this week, Canadians are acknowledging the history and heritage of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. At this event in Calgary, opening ceremonies are underway for Aboriginal Awareness Week. The theme here is giving back to the community. A free lunch is provided, and a fiddler entertains the crowd. Calgary is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, and also sits on traditional Treaty 7 land, which includes Blackfoot Confederacy, Sutina First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda. This acknowledgement is often made during formal events and public gatherings. But how many people know about the traditional land and the people that occupy it? Should it be taught in schools? And what should every student know? We took this question to the street. What should Canadians learn in school about First Nations history and culture? I think the area, the local tribes that are around the area, definitely importance of them, history between that, especially in Calgary, you know, the tribes and how important they are to the city and any kind of treaties, all those, a lot of little things. I think residential school is a big important piece, but I think as definitely as kids get older, they're able to understand it a lot more than when they're a lot smaller in elementary. So definitely respecting cultures as well, I think it's important for sure. Every Canadian, I believe, they should know about the residential schools. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people, they criticize Aboriginal people or Indian people for not having our languages or our customs. But that was taken away from our people. And a lot of our people had to move from the reserves to the cities to be educated, to be to be able to compete with today's society. Absolutely the truth. Colonization is not taught across Canada. Um, I don't know why, because uh, it keeps the stereotype, the negative one, still alive. We're not, I mean, new people that come to Canada still look at us that we're savages. And, you know, it's, it's time. Clean up the Education Act and you know, it's not all about residential school. I would love to see more of their stories told, not just from our perspective of this is what happened and the dates on which it happened, which is a lot of what I remember being taught. But I would like to hear more of, uh, more of the First Nations people come into schools and tell their stories from their perspectives. I think there's a large chunk of First Nations uh, history and culture that isn't uh, as prevalent as it should be. Uh, and I think, and I think, because of the history we've had in Canada trying to assimilate them in the past, it's still coming back. And it's good to see that it's becoming a little bit more um, prevalent in education, but it's still got a long way to go. Inuktitut is one of the stronger indigenous languages in this country. Uh, there's, other, there's us who are fully bilingual, very fluent in our own language, although it was trying Try, they try to take it away from us. We still have it, and it's our identity. Uh, there's lots of Inuit who should be learning Inuktitut, and the onus should be on the federal government to give uh, teachings of indigenous languages. It, you got to remember, they're the ones who try to take the language away. The onus should be on them to provide adequate and sufficient funding so that in all Inuit could learn and enhance their language skills in their own language. I think it's time to finally step up to preserving um, 
indigenous languages. Um, it's been lost over the years, but I think uh, we are stepping up to revitalizing uh, all indigenous languages. The indigenous languages are just surviving, actually. They're in a survival mode. We have to have legislation to make sure our future generations, my granddaughter, my grand, great grandkids, will be able to speak it and be proud of where they come from. Well, certainly when I went to school, I learned nothing about First Nations history or culture. And I think that in some places, they're, they're not learning enough at all. Certainly, we should all know more about the res residential school experience. And we certainly should know more about their um, the rights that they have as uh, individuals living uh, under treaties with or without treaties. They, we certainly as settlers don't know enough about First Nations and their rights. Uh, they should be learning as much as they possibly can. I think it's very important. Um, they should be learning all about residential schools. Um, it should be a very large part of their uh, their curriculum. We should become more aware of what they actually did for the country rather than what we see on the streets, you know. Because there's a lot of proud uh, people in the native culture and done famous things like artists, painters, singers. We should be made aware of them. I think that should be a very prominent part of um, school and education right now. Um, I think that is the history of the country that we live in and it's important to recognize that um, continuing forward in our history. For instance, out in uh, Halifax, where I'm from, we just took down the Edward Cornwallis statue in the little park that was dedicated to uh, colonial times. It's not that he was terribly evil, but it was uh, symbolic of things that were misguided at the time. So a uh, learning of history, uh, not to rewrite it and eliminate it, but to um, understand what actually happened there. Maybe um, a broader story. I think we so often hear just, uh, maybe not, I don't know if a one-sided, but a very, very narrow um, aspect of it. In and around Whitehorse is the Kwanlin Dunn First Nation, the largest in Yukon Territory. At the head of the Yukon River, an historic meeting place between traditional peoples and their trading partners. First Nations from Tagish, Kwamani, and Little Salmon. The artifacts and spearheads found there date back more than 2,000 years. But this week, Whitehorse gets a new piece of history. The city's government signed an intergovernmental declaration of commitment with two First Nations here, including Kwanlin Dunn. Sheesh. Thank you for always being there for us. And unveiled a public art project celebrating Yukon First Nations arts. Not far from this scene at City Hall is another celebration for Kwanlin Dunn. The First Nation is one of 16 communities to receive funding for a new baseball diamond from the Blue Jays Cares Foundation and its ignited baseball fever in the area. This weekend, a territory-wide tournament is taking place on the Old Field. An outburst contributor, Rhiannon Russell, takes us to the last practice on their Old Diamond and explains why this unlikely tournament is an important part of truth and reconciliation. Have you played on the field at all yet? No. You told us not to. <laughs> not until Friday. I'm Rhiannon Russell and I'm in Whitehorse, where the community is finding reconciliation through the right to play. On this baseball field today, Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth, making up the Yukon Rookie League, are practicing for a tournament this weekend that will bring together kids from across the territory. It's the culmination of a month-long leadership and athletic development program. We had practices at the Canada Games where Nevaeh didn't know that he was a leader until he got out there and, and actually started feeling comfortable with it. And that was one of the great things to see is a guy like this who so many kids look up to to come out and to run a practice and to see the way the kids are very attentive to what he had to say. He was very organized. He'd always come in with the plan. Uh, you get some help from your mom and dad, which was fantastic. Can't wait to throw the first pitch. Hope I don't mess up. I'm sure you'll be great. My first meeting with my Council of Other Advocates was at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's um, closing ceremony. And we all left there with an inspiration to do something more for children and youth and to, to do uh, reconciliation. And so we decided to put together the TRC 
and the United Nations Rights for Children, and we focus on um, Article 12, the right for youth participation, Article 30, the rights to culture, and Article 31, the right to play. Every kid should have the opportunity to try and play the sports that they know and love because sports are honestly something that have bring, brought a lot of people together and it can continue to do so. It's pretty much the end goal. We're not sure what the prize is, if there is a prize at the end, but everybody's playing their hardest and it's really fun knowing that everybody gets another shot to play baseball. Only Yukon Territory and the Northwest Territories celebrate it as a statutory holiday. But since 1996, June 21st has been a day to celebrate Indigenous culture and heritage in Canada. 22 years ago, then Governor General Romeo LeBlanc announced June 21st would be known as National Aboriginal Day. It's since been changed to National Indigenous Peoples Day, a day designated for all Canadians to recognize the culture, traditions, and contributions of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Our question to you, should National Indigenous Peoples Day be a statutory holiday? I think we deserve it. Uh, we've done a lot of things for, you know, this country, just like you guys have done a lot of things too, but I think we should have a day where we're recognized. It should be recognized as a holiday. You know, the Queen has her day. You know, why not us have our day? I, I agree. I think it should be a national holiday. I think it's an important day. You know, it probably could warrant being a, a national holiday. I mean, I look at what else gets honored in a year and, you know, you know and I, I don't think it's out of the question to think that it would be. Yes, absolutely. I think, I think it should definitely be a national holiday. It, it was started in 1996. Um, and it's about time they kind of name it a national holiday, give it a stat. They've, you know, Canada's 151 years old and Indigenous people have been here for since time immemorial, right? Um, and why not provide a national holiday that everyone can have an opportunity to have some time to spend with their families and learn a little bit more about Indigenous culture, right? So, yeah. Uh, you know, I came, I'm an immigrant to this country. I've been here 40 years, but I came as an immigrant. I think it's important, the, the, uh, you know, to, to recognize the, uh, the, that culture and First Nations and the impact that they have on, on our society and history. Um, I'm not sure, you know, that, that, it, that it, it needs to be a holiday. Um, the recognition should be there. Uh, I mean, I think, I think the, the, uh, rec um, the reconciliation, the truth and reconciliation has, should do more, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, to uh, bring society to focus more on what the issues are with First Nations. Uh, I, you know, I'm, 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 sh I'm not sure it should be a national holiday. We're on borrowed land. Uh, we're all here from somewhere. And why not? Why not? If they can be recognized, uh, if the, that particular day can be recognized and acknowledged, yes, of course. You know, why? Do you give a national holiday to everybody? You know, so. Well, if uh, you have a particular person you want to celebrate and it's worthwhile, then yeah, I'd look at it. But just to say, oh yeah, well, today is an Aboriginal holiday, no, I, I can't see that. I think so. Um, the founding people of our country, um, I don't really look like it, but I'm, I'm status Aboriginal as well. Um, yeah, something that we were in elementary school, I'm glad that we were always kind of on that day, we always went and did something, whether it was going to Treaty 4, um, learning how like a TP would be set up or, uh, you know, different history stuff like that. But no, yeah, I think it should be a national holiday. What's important is that uh, Aboriginal culture, Aboriginal people and the history be remembered and, uh, you know, and, and be taught. I don't know what that means in terms of whether a holiday does that or whether there's other ways to do it. I you know, just don't have a <laughs> don't have a good sense of that. I think uh, yeah, I think it should be more recognized in Canada, and we should have a it should be a national holiday, definitely. Yes, I think it should be a national holiday. I mean, there's Aboriginals all across Canada from um, all of the Indians and 
uh, across the southern part of and uh, as well as uh, the Inuit and uh, the other regions and whatnot. So yeah, I think it should be a national holiday. Yes, uh, uh, so I said, yes, uh, it's, it came from our mother tongues and uh, from our ancestors. Uh, before there was real Canadian um, uh, parliament and we were here a thousand years ago. The history of indigenous peoples in Canada and in North America goes back long before European and Viking settlers first reached our shores. Today, there are 634 First Nations communities across the country with over 50 different languages. But as we all know, the history of Indigenous peoples also has its share of strife and struggle, with much of it at the hands of the federal government. But through it all, the sense of pride felt by Indigenous peoples has been woven into the Canadian fabric, and that continues to this day. Our next question, what does it mean to be Indigenous in Canada? Like me as a kid, when I was young, I, I grew up in a northern community and we had a lot, large population of indigenous. But I did not learn the history, I did not know anything. And, and now as an adult, I feel like I could just, I wish I could turn back that time and go back and think of all the people I shared my classroom with and, and just get to know them because we really, there was you know, them and us, and it, it's so hurtful to think that that's the way it was not long ago at all. And so now I just think there's so much, so much pride, so, such a bright future, I think, for all of us together. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, speaking as someone who's a non-Indigenous person, um, but having worked for many years with Indigenous cultures, I would hope that it it means having open dialogue now and being able to talk about the history and the past and um, thinking openly about cultures now, even beyond um, people who are Indigenous, yeah. I think this can be interpreted in many different ways by people. For me, Indigenous people have a very immense sense of pride for their culture and stuff like that, which I think is really good. And I think being indigenous means different things to different people, but I think, I think it's cool. I think it's very good to be proud of who you are and proud of what your culture is and stuff like that. And I know many people that are. I don't know. I like they should be culture. proud of, yeah, they should be proud of who they are. Their culture is fantastic and they have a lot of good morals and they're a big part of Canada. Like they, it, they're, it's a big part of Canada history. And I don't think we should be abolishing that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Like, I have a lot of friends that are Indigenous, and um, I just, like, I, I'm in, interested, very interested in their culture and, like, um, the cultural dances and what they represent, and I like how they're they're very strong in what they believe yeah. in. And, That's, yeah. Yeah. and we also, we went to school with uh, Siksika Nation, so we actually had two graduation ceremonies. We had a powwow ceremony, and we had an actual formal graduation ceremony. And anyone could and come to the powwow. Yeah, and it was just fantastic to watch, and we actually, uh, we were dipped in culture. Like, it was just fantastic to watch, and I think we should all be dipped in culture and be diversified a little bit. I think it would be difficult. I really do. I think it'd be difficult. There's still a lot of racism and prejudice against people who are indigenous and it seems to be one of those things that's still remaining that people are more open about perhaps someone's sexuality or perhaps their economic background or but it seems like it seems like it's an uphill battle for many of our indigenous people here in Canada and I'd like to see that change that people are more aware and I think that only comes through knowing someone you know when you know someone you can understand them and so if you are you know, one of those people that's living in your suburbs and never knowing anyone of, of a different background, how can you start to understand them? And I think that it's not just, it's something that ha people, people have to work together and coming together to learn about each other. But I feel like, I feel it, it would be difficult, I really do, to be an Indigenous person in Canada. What does it mean to be Indigenous in Canada? Well, I am from mixed descent. Uh, my mother is Inuk, so is my father, but my mother's mother is Cree Indian from James Bay. So indig being indigenous is twofold, uh, in the Inuit world and in the Cree world. 
So in indigenous, indigenous day specifically hopefully teaches other peoples about us, the indigenous peoples of this country. Um, and hopefully they get to learn more about us as to who we are and how things should be in this country with, in regards to indigenous issues. What it means to me is um, a lot of things. Um, speaking the language, the culture. I work at an organization um, at Ottawa Inuit Children's Centre, so for me, being an Indigenous, I get to um, share my culture and uh, my language to the young ones and the youth. It means a lot to me to be Inuk and living in this land. It's been three years since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission issued 94 calls to action, which includes an inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And the truth-telling continues last week in Toronto, and next week there will be hearings in Regina. Our question, do you believe the inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls is on the right track? I think it's on the right track, but it doesn't seem to be... Um doesn't seem to be it's not being solved certainly but uh, I don't know how much more they could do you know to try and solve this well it seems like there's a lot of people dropping out I'd like to believe it's on the right track my firm belief is that the person in charge doesn't understand the program itself you know we have to uh, maybe some of the elders bring them on board having uh, the tragedy put in front of us so that it absolutely cannot be ignored or put under the carpet or anything uh, silly like that. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, of course, I defer to the indigenous people themselves. Uh, I assume it's, there's not enough uh, work done towards that just, and I only say this because the absolute number you see are missing. There's something wrong, something's missing. So has that been done properly or is it being done properly would be a question that I have because in any big difficult task there's always going to be people that don't like what you're doing or how you're doing but I think in this instance it should require um, you need to have the majority of people comfortable with what's happening you're not going to please all the people all the time. It is a start uh, certainly one of the big things is the impact both of the incidents where you lost uh, someone who was loved, but once you start talking about that, it opens up all kinds of other things mm -hmm. and people really require supports right. and a chance to continue to talk about it so that they can get to a place where it will never go away, but it can be a part of who they are rather than all of who they are. Uh, and that's way beyond um, that particular structure's capacity. I think it's on the right track as long as it doesn't get too politically motivated and too complex and mired down in, uh, in that kind of politics. It should be uh, straightforward with no political interventions or, or that kind of overtone to it. Just do the facts, get to the bottom of it, and uh, without trying to play politics to do it, to do it justice. I think there's been too many inquiries on these things, and I think once they do come up with an answer, they're just going to shelve it and probably have another one 10 years down the road again. So I'm not sure. I, it's kind of a weird how they put a time limit on it, and it just seems like uh, something that should be ongoing and not, uh, not rushed, because there's a lot of missing and murdered Aboriginal women, and it's not going to be enough to to see or hear everybody or see everybody in that short amount of time? I think it's going pretty good because if truth and reconciliation didn't happen, we wouldn't be at this stage where we're talking about legislation regarding our first languages in Canada. More time should have been spent on the truth itself, the history behind it. If people understand and have more knowledge of the history of the indigenous peoples, and surrounding um, the truth and reconciliation, I think people ha should have a better understanding of the truth 
as to why we are trying to reconcile issues. Uh, I think the reconciliation would progress better for the indigenous peoples if other peoples, and e including the indigenous peoples themselves, if they knew more about the truth behind the whole uh, issue. There's always ups and downs to any kind of um, um, stuff like that. So truth and reconciliation, um, it's a working progress. But it's going, uh, for me, I think it's going well because we are now creating uh, Indigenous Language Act, which is very important to uh, truth and reconciliation. So I think it's really important to, um, to share that and finally go through the Indigenous Act. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anne Lang and we're at the Evergreen Brickworks in Toronto. Hundreds of people have come to an event here to discuss the future of reconciliation in Canada. And among them is a group of Indigenous artists who are challenging the way we view that issue. The elders knew that the Great Spirit would reward the just cause. The ancient ritual, Kahawagano, loosely translated to Iroquois, mud wrestling, was fought. There's a group of seven artists who were invited to be a part of this Walrus Talk Live and they asked us to come in and um, create and uh, like animate the space and of course like as Indigenous people we're invited often to do these kinds of things and we're asked to do a very specific kind of performance, traditional mm -hmm. and so we were like, oh, we have to like, do this traditional thing that we all come from different nations, like Mohawk and uh, Dene and Cree and Métis. And we were told to like, think about reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to create something that was it, it addressing that, you know, really addressing how like, we, you put together all these artists and expect to have 15 minutes of a performance in the end. And like traditionally, or not traditionally, but often people want to see traditional Indigenous stuff. Very serious ceremony. So we gave it. We, we, we created this very serious ceremony. We are serious about reconciliation. We are here to struggle with you for it. Reconciliation doesn't just happen. It's not easy. You don't just sit there, you fight for it. You get messy about it. Now, who's gonna join me? <laughs> nope, you. We had about eight hours, six hours, to come up with a 15 minute uh, piece that speaks to reconciliation in some way. That's impossible. I'm telling you that cannot be done. So we're sitting around the table and uh, Sherry Miracle says, oh, hey, you know, I got an idea, what if we do uh, yeah, Iroquois mud wrestling? And it sat there on the table for about five seconds. And then everyone just went, yeah, yeah, that, that, right? Because it was, it was uh, in terms of spectacle, we could not do better than Iroquois mud wrestling. Thank you for fighting for reconciliation with me. I certainly wasn't planning on participating so immediately, but when they started pouring things into that pool, I was like, what is happening? We both kind of got dirty, and I think that's part of the, the, you know, the story too, is that it gets getting dirty. It gets sort of getting close to people. It gets to be about touching people and, and joining in and like making yourself vulnerable and taking off your assumptions and, and, and expectations about what's going to happen. That's all for this episode of Outburst. Do you have an opinion you'd like to share? Well, you can reach us on social media at CPAC underscore TV or via email at outburst at CPAC.ca.